Felix would recast his entire life. At 17, he had become a peer of the realm, one of the richest at that. But just as important, the isolation of his early years afforded him a blank slate on which to create a whole new persona for himself. It did not take him long to decide that, of course, he was his mother's son. The late Marchioness of Renworth, despite her insidious domestic tyranny, had maintained an unblemished reputation as a perfect lady, a shining example of all that was good and pure in a woman. He planned to eclipse her in both acclaim and influence, a fitting tribute from the son for whom she had so little regard. As for his father, Felix's tribute to him would be to never repeat the man's great mistake of loving with all his heart and soul. Friendship he would permit, and perhaps some mild affections. Love, however, was out of the question. Love made one powerless, and he had had enough powerlessness to last ten lifetimes. In this new life of his, he would always hold all the power. And he succeeded remarkably. He was extremely popular with his classmates at Cambridge, where he read mathematics and physics. He conquered London society with equal aplomb and became in no time one of the country's most eligible bachelors. In the beginning, he worried that he'd meet a girl who would enslave him. But seasons passed, ladies he met by the gross, and not a single one caused the slightest ripple in his heart. It was as if his capacity to love had been buried six feet under alongside his parents. Once in a blue moon, when he was alone at night with the stars, he missed it, the ability to feel and feel deeply. But the rest of the time he was all too glad to be in absolute control over every aspect of his life, particularly his heart. In 1885, when he turned 25, he let out the word that he was ready to settle down with the right girl. The matrons heaved a collective sigh of relief. How wonderful! The boy actually understood his duties to God and country. He had no intention of marrying, of course, until he was at least forty-five. A society that so worshipped the infernal institution of marriage deserved to be misled. Let them try to matchmake. He did say the right girl, didn't he? The right girl wouldn't come along for twenty years, and she'd be a naive, plump-chested chit of seventeen who worshipped the ground on which he trod. Little could he guess that at twenty-eight he would marry, out of the blue, a lady who was quite some years removed from seventeen, neither naive nor plump-chested, and who examined the ground on which he trod with a most suspicious eye, seeing villainy in everything he said and did. Her name was Louisa Cantwell, and she would be his undoing.